Um, if you'd like to stand for the reading of God's word, I'll be reading Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown, away, thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light up light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You may be seated. Thank you, Diane. I think most of us believe that God answers prayer, right? But there are times when God answers prayer in maybe not quite the way that we would have anticipated. There's a story about a young mother who was at work one day and she got a call from the babysitter. That's that call that all mothers at work dread. The babysitter said, your daughter has taken ill. She's running a very high fever. I don't know what to do. Can you help? Well, the mother called the doctor and they called in a prescription at the local pharmacy and she called the babysitter and told her that she's going to get the, the prescription and she'll come running home to help. Well, in her and um, being in all of the busyness and her being flustered, she got the prescription. She went out to the car only to discover that she had locked her keys in her car. She was frantic. She didn't know what to do. She, she began to look around. She called the babysitter and said, oh, no, I locked my keys in the car. And the babysitter you know, said, why don't you look for a coat hanger? <laughs> See if you can unlock it. So she said, well, I'll do my best and I'll get back to you as soon as she said, hurry, because the fever is going up. So the mother at this point is just panicking, going crazy. So she looks around and, she, and lo and behold, she finds a coat hanger. It's an, an old rusty coat hanger that someone had obviously used for just this purpose at some time in the past. And so she started working on the car and realized very soon she had no idea how to, how to work the coat hanger. So she finally stopped what she should have done in the first place and said, Dear Lord, would you help me? My daughter's sick. I have the medicine. The, cars, the keys are in the car. I just need help. Could you send someone to help? No sooner had she said amen than a rusty, smoky, beat-up old car pulled up into the parking spot right next to her. The door opened and out unfolded this very tall, bearded gentleman who had tattoos and long hair and a skull cap. And she goes, Oh, Lord. Is this who you send? But she was, she was panicked. So she said, sir, sir, could you help me? She, she told him her story and said, is it possible? Do you know how to, could you, could you open my car? He said, sure, lady, no problem. So he took the coat hanger, had the thing open in about 10 seconds. Oh, she hugged him and she was crying. She said, oh, thank you. You're such a nice man. He goes, lady, I am not a nice man. In fact, I have been in prison for the last two years for car theft. I just got out about an hour ago, and she just yelled, oh, praise the Lord, you even sent a professional. <laughs> God does answer prayer in some of the strangest ways. Well, last week we started talking about what it means as a church and what we intend as leadership to be radically transformed. And I don't know how far we got with that, how far it penetrated, but God intends for us to not just be transformed, but radically transformed to the limit. He, he doesn't want to just change the schema, the outward appearance. That's the, the Greek word for the outward part of us. He wants to change the morphe, that, that inner part, that, that part of who we really are. You see, man, we can change the outside, and it really doesn't make a difference. But God can change us from the inside out, and it will radically change transform us. Well, we want to do that for the purpose of being salt and light in our community to everyone we meet. I think most often we hear sermons about light. We like that. You're the light of the world in a city on a hill, and we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. But today we're going to talk about salt, and occasionally you hear a sermon about being the salt of the earth and what that really means, that how we are salt. I think most Commonly, we think, well, we're spice. Christianity is the spice of life. We're to spice things up. And I guarantee you, we live in some pretty dark times. We live in some pretty bland times where a little spice is helpful. But we also, we understand that salt was used as a preservative. So we get that. We have a world that's decaying, and we're the preservative to help, to help keep our world on track the way it needs to be. But there's another use for salt that we don't think about so much. And with all the modern technology, we don't do it today, but... 
The wise farmer in Jesus' day knew that if they took just the right amount of salt and spread it on the fields, it would increase, increase productivity. It would make the fields more able to bear a good harvest. Today we want to talk about what that means as being a, a fertilizer. One author has said this, Being salt, fertilizing our society means getting deep beneath the hard-baked surface. It requires mixing things up, turning the top to the bottom again and again until the old stratifications in the soil have been destroyed. Preachers permanently perched in their pulpits and congregations glued to their pews are useless, sterile clumps. In fact, when salt clings to itself, it forms a toxic zone. Many of us have seen the evidence of that in, in the winter runoff on the highways where it actually poisons the soil around it so that nothing can grow. That is not the body of Christ. That is not the body of Christ. That is a disease, a cancer that eats away rather than heals and promotes growth. I am learning that we, as the church of God, are in this to make waves, not to test the waters. Can I say that again? We are in this Christian life, this journey, to make waves. God intends for us to make waves, not just to test the waters. You see, I think that for most of us and for most Christians in America today, there really is not much cost for serving Jesus. I mean, we really, we talk about persecution, we talk about how difficult it is to share our faith with people, but I, I, I have a feeling that most of what we face is really self-imagined rather than legitimate. Let me, let me ask a question. When was the last time that you were really persecuted for serving Christ? I mean, when was the last time that you were denied food or drink or housing or a job or any of that kind of stuff because of your relationship with Christ? We know that some of our brothers and sisters around the world are facing that. But for us, the pressure that we face today is probably mostly social. Do you understand what I mean by that? Being a Christian, being, standing for our, 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 our ideals and our, um, my brain, what's the word I'm looking for? Beliefs? <laughs> Pastor should know beliefs. But standing for those kinds of things doesn't really cost us in America. Now, I do understand that there's, they're having some struggles in California right now, that they're trying to close the churches down, and there's, there's some, some battles where they're, they're deciding, and I think in one area, that they're going to fine people $1,000, everyone who goes to church, when they've been told not to go to church. They're facing a court case, so there is a battle going on. But in America, we really don't face persecution. I mean, there, there's no... <laughs> There's no question, let's see if I can do this right, that a born-again, spirit-filled, red-hot, Bible-reading, devil-stomping, changed my world for Jesus 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 32 days a month, 365 and a quarter days a year type of a Christian is not considered the cool thing by most people. But let me tell you, if you are that kind of a Christian, and listen, I think we should be, if you're that kind of Christian, one of two things is going to happen. People will either avoid you. In fact, some of them will run from you, or they'll be drawn to you like moths to the flame. That fruit of the Spirit, I love, I talk about it all the time. It's called goodness, agathusony, and it means goodness with an attitude. It's the kind of goodness that people, when they step into your presence, they're both convicted and they're drawn to it at the same time. That's what God intends for us to be. You see, friends, we aren't spiritual we aren't Christian because of how excited we get on Sunday. We're not, we're not Christian or spiritual because we can jump and shout and hoot and holler a bit. You know, it's kind of easy to do that on Sunday. I, I wish we would do a little bit more of it. You know, if you're happy, notify your face, right? But the real test of whether you truly are a born-again, spirit-filled, devil-stomping, Bible-reading, red-hot, whatever I said a minute ago, kind of Christian, it'll show up on Monday. See, Monday's when it matters because we don't have this protective cocoon on Monday as much. Well, this verse that we've read that we're going to highlight today tells us that we must, what it means to be salty Christians. We must move out of our pews and into our world. 
We will never discover that immeasurably more that God wants for us until we choose, truly choose to do that. So if you're following with your notes, here's number one. Number one, salt makes things happen. Salt makes things happen. I mean, real salt does too, but I'm talking about us as salt, okay? Three things that salt does. First off, salt is a preservative. We keep things from going rotten in the world we live in. One author said this, The Christian must be the cleansing antiseptic in any society in which he happens to be. He must be the person who by his presence defeats corruption and makes it easier for others to be good. God intends for us to preserve the society, to be agents for change within our society. The second thing is that we are to be the spice of life. And I've already summed it up, but if it can be summed up with this. If Jesus is on the inside, he ought to be working on the outside. I mean, if Jesus really is on the inside, I mean, if he's really on the inside, it, it'll show up on the outside. Let me say that again, because I got one half amen there. <laughs> if Jesus really is on the inside, it ought to show up on the outside, right? I, I mean, and, and so the other side of that is if, if, if it doesn't show up on the outside... Is it really working on the inside? Yeah, amen or ouch is right. We are to spice up life. We are to be agents of change in this world we live in. Salt does that. And as a fertilizer, we are the catalyst that makes things happen. That's the third one, a fertilizer. Our presence, coupled with the presence of the Almighty, makes every situation better. Here's what I mean. There are certain people that walk into a room and everything gets worse. You know what I'm talking about. You know the kind of people. You know the circle, you know. And then there's another kind of person that when they walk into the room, everything gets better. That's what we are intended to be as God's salt. We are intended to make everything better. We are seeds for change in the field of this world. And as fertilizer, what it does is it increases the health of the plants. It enriches the soil. It increases the harvest. I guess that's the ultimate test, is what kind of harvest is produced by our lives with those we come in contact with. Number two this morning, salt is meant to be shared. Salt is meant to be shared. There are so many so-called fertilizers out there that are destroying rather than helping. They look good on the outside, but ultimately they aren't producing anything in the larger scheme of things. I've not found many people who will reject something that will make their life better. Hear me, if it makes their life better. In other words, if it works. Uh, does that make sense? I mean, a lot of people have to see it to believe it, and I don't blame them. I mean, we want to know that a product works before we buy it. And, and it amazes me how often we, even as God's children, can get so excited about a new miracle cleaner or some kind of a new device or some kind of a new invention or, or some infomercial nonsense, and we're happy to share it. I, I, I think back at myself when I was a young parent. I probably told you this before. I remember helping other young parents pick out diaper cream. I never thought in a thousand years that I would talk to some, some young gal who's sitting there with her baby and telling me her sad story in comparing diaper creams. But man, we found one that worked, and man, I was happy to share that. This stuff works. You need to try this. But here's the deal, folks. Does a relationship with Jesus work? when we run into people all the time who need that help? I appreciate John. John's always talking about opportunities to share Jesus with people. And I appreciate he just does that. A lot of people are fearful of doing it, but he hit it exactly right last night when we were talking at prayer. He said, I, I just said, well, you know what? The best day for me was when I gave my heart to Jesus. And now I know I get to go to heaven. And that changed my life. And here, here's the deal. If it really changes your life, 
and people see it, they'll want some of that. They'll be drawn to it. We can make a difference. We can if we really want to. The real question is, do we want to? Do we want to? Number three, salt is supposed to be salty. That's kind of a dumb statement, isn't it? But the fact is, salt is supposed to be salty. Jesus said that we are to be the catalyst for the world. He made it plain that the world is our field. But then he said that the question is not if you're a Christian, but have you lost your saltiness? Your ability, in other words, to make a difference in your world for Christ. I, I don't mean to step on your toes this morning, but I have a question that I feel Holy Spirit would have me ask. Are you making a difference in your world for Christ? Have you lost your saltiness? If you aren't active in your church, if you're not adding souls to the kingdom, if, if you're not contributing, if you're not spicing things up around you, if you are so worried about keeping the status quo and making sure that no one's feelings are hurt, huh, so much so that you aren't making a bit of difference for the kingdom, perhaps you've lost your saltiness. And the sad, sorry part of it is, Jesus said, what happens to salt that loses its saltiness? It's good for... They take it and they toss it out. It's of no value. It's very easy in our eagerness to serve Christ through our complicated organizational structures, through what we call the business of the church. Through our, convention, through our conventions and assemblies, proclamations and creed. It's very easy to forget the primary reason for our existence. I wanted to read this bit of a story. Podovesky, in one of the most outstanding of all, he, one of the most outstanding of all Russian writers in his novel, The Brothers Kamar, um, Kamarov, recognized this condition in the church of his day. In one of the chapters of this story, it's called The Grand Inquisitor, he expresses his feelings in a chilling and terrifying story. The setting, it's the days of the Spanish Inquisition in Seville. Jesus had just returned to earth. He comes to Seville and he's walking toward this massive Gothic cathedral in the vast square. As Jesus is walking across, a funeral procession is slowly moving toward the cathedral steps. The only child of a noble citizen has died. Her little casket is being carried to the cathedral. Suddenly, the people see Jesus, and they recognize him immediately, and he has come back as he promised. Here he is among them now, and the one to whom their prayers and hopes have been directed. It's Jesus. He can give new life to this child, as he did so long ago in Palestine. So the people call to him, and he goes to the procession. They cry out, Jesus, heal this child. The mother falls on her knees in front of him. Have mercy on me. If you will, you can put new life in my child. He pauses and raises both hands high in the air, and he cries out to God. He says, let this child live. And to the utter amazement of everyone, the child moves, sits up surrounded by all the flowers, smiles, and calls out to her mother. The people begin to chant, he has come to us. He has come. He has come. Jesus has come. However, standing in the shadows of the cathedral is the Grand Inquisitor, the powerful cardinal of the church. What he has seen, he does not like. He sees Jesus' arrival not as an occasion for rejoicing, but as a threat to his authority. So the cardinal has Jesus arrested and placed in a solitary prison cell. Late that night, the cardinal comes alone to visit his prisoner. Why have you come, he demands. We no longer have need of you. We are now in charge of your church. We know how to run it well. Why have you come back to disturb our peace and our authority? Leave us now. Do not come back. We have no need of you. Lodovesky has Jesus look long and lovingly into the empty eyes of the cardinal. Then Jesus stands. He walks across the cell. 
kisses the cardinal lightly on his thin, bloodless lips, then walks out of the cell, leaving the cardinal alone with his great cathedral. So why do we do this? Why do we come here to worship Sunday after Sunday, 52 Sundays a year, for 5, 10, 30 years, maybe a whole lifetime? Getting up early on Sunday morning, getting ready, getting the children dressed, driving over in all sorts of weather, sometimes not feeling too well ourselves, angry at the government, worried about our health and financial problems, dressed in our best or our best behavior, walking into the building, greeting friends, singing hymns, praying prayers, reading scripture, listening to sermons, bringing our offering and taking the bread and cup. We call it worship of God, but why do we do this? I'm sure that many, there are many reasons, but deep down inside I feel that we do this in the hope that we might get to know Jesus of Nazareth better. We're seeking our primary source of life. In our purpose to know him better, perhaps our lives will be better. Perhaps our world will be better. In reality, do we not come seeking Jesus? You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how will its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. We've said that we want to be a radically transformed people. I think that most Christians would say, yes, I really want Jesus to change me. I really want him to help me become something brand new something better and greater than I could ever be on my own. I, I think that we really want that. I think that, that we really have that as our intention. The question is whether we'll do it or not. As we go in just a few minutes, ask yourself, Have I lost my saltiness? Pray with me. Father, thank you for your simple word today. I truly believe that we want to be a transformed people. I do. I, I, I think that in our minds that we really want to do that. But Lord, I pray that you would move that not from our minds only, but to our hearts. Help us to move past just wanting to, to actually doing. Not just being hearers of the word going, amen, that's right, that's right on, but help us to be doers of the word. Lord, we know we can't do it on our own, but thankfully we don't have to. We have you to help us. So I pray today that you would speak to each one of us. Show us anything in our life that doesn't line up with your will for us. Help us to surrender that willingly so that we can become men and women, boys and girls who are running hard after you. Father, I, I give permission in your name for us to spice up the world around us. Help us, Father, to spread that salt, to fertilize our society, to fertilize our relationships, our schools and our places of work. with your love. Thank you, Father, that you allow us to be a part of this amazing journey. Thank you that you allow us to be a part of life-changing events. Lord, I can't wait to see what happens when we really choose to do it. Thank you. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Please stand and greet those around you with those air fives. You are dismissed. God bless.